David, you're also co-host. So if you find someone, you can just put them up the panelist. Okay, uh, Taylor, are you there? Uh, I am. Yeah, could I ask, um, um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Could I ask you a favor? Would you be willing to serve as uh, session chair for this session? We have a last minute cancellation. Um, I can try. <laughs> I haven't read the, the chairing guidelines in preparation of chairing tomorrow, so I can do my best. It's 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 really pretty simple, as you as I think you know. Um, you just um, you know I think break in, and if people are going way over time, tell them stop, and uh, and then moderate the question and answer. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think I can do that. Okay, great. I really appreciate it. Um, sorry, we I almost never have to do this, but I appreciate your. Uh, stepping in. So I'm going to um, actually, I think uh, Ken just promoted you to co host. Yeah, I just moved him up. Okay, great. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. And I'm going to bow out now, but, um, you know, break a leg, everyone. And um, thanks. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> welcome to Psycholinguistics 2. I am surprise co-chairing or surprise chairing the session today. Uh, so we, I'm looking forward to getting started. Bear with me as I have not read the instructions. Um, so the, the first uh, presented talk today is going to be social network diversity impacts accentedness judgments toward racialized groups. That's uh, Ethan Cutler from University of Florida. And I am going to attempt to now give you the floor. All right. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Should we wait? Oh, I'm. You know what? Yeah. Good trial run there. I'll wait until it actually is supposed to start. Okay. I, I... <laughs> no worries. All right. Yeah, I just got very excited to to. Yeah. Um, let me ask since since we do have a couple minutes and I have not done this yet. Um, is there anything? Do you know if there's anything that I need to do in order to um, make sure that you have that you're, uh, that everybody sees you, that you're the, the main screen that they see. Uh, I have that under control. You don't need to worry about that. Oh, excellent. Yeah, um, you're, you're basically just emceeing and then I'm doing all the spotlights and everything. Beautiful, so so we're good. Yep. <laughs> all right. All right, excellent. Oh man, I thought I was just gonna, you know, have a nice relaxed <laughs> evening. Just You did great though. <laughs> All right, well, I see it's like getting to see the sound check before a concert. All right, we are, I believe, at the correct start time now. Um, I will not try and figure out what time zones everybody's in. Uh, so this is Psycholinguistics 1, Part 2, uh, concurrent session, Zoom Room 3. And the presented abstracts are social network diversity impacts accentedness judgment towards racialized groups. Resumptive pronouns facilitate processing of long distance relative clause dependencies in second language English and processing obviation in Border Lakes Ojibwe. So without further ado, I wanna get started on the first abstract, social network diversity impacts accentedness judgments toward racialized groups by Ethan Kudlow at University of Florida. You have the floor. Thank you, Taylor. Um, hi everyone, I'm gonna um, go ahead and share my screen real quick here. Second. All right. Okay, I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen and that you can hear me. Um, hi again, everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan Kutlu. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Florida's psychology department. And today I'll be presenting two of my experiments for my um, dissertation research. So at the beginning of each talk, I pick a quote um, that I feel like it will summarize what I'll be talking about that day. And for today, I picked a quote from Miyagi um, Essie's Transcendent Kingdom. 
Um, some people make it out of their stories thriving, some people don't. Um, and I hope that this quote will remain with you uh, throughout my talk. So please make sure to keep this in mind. And before I begin my talk, I also would like to acknowledge uh, my undergraduate research assistants who helped me tremendously in collecting data, preparation of data, um, and also my collaborators at McGill University who helped me collect data in Montreal. And finally, I acknowledge that the city of Gainesville and the University of Florida both reside um, on the land of Timucua people and the Seminole people of uh, Florida. So I reside on this land and I respect all the past and present um, generations of indigenous people. A quick disclaimer for those of you who may or may not be familiar with this type of work. Um, this talk features topics on racial inequalities and systematic minoritization of racialized groups. I acknowledge my privilege as a white person and how important it is to hear from um, scholars and uh, folks who are burdened by these inequalities. So I would like to invite you to please make sure to check Dr. Megan Figueroa's list on um, scholars to read and know in the field of language sciences, where she amplifies the voices of individuals who have been burdened by these inequalities. If you cannot find that list, it's also on my um, website. It's directly linked to um, Dr. Dr. Figueroa's list. All right, so let's begin with my um, dissertation research. So a quick introduction uh, of what I'm working on. It starts with speech perception. So a plethora of research suggests that many factors could impact the way that we um, in, in engage in speech perception. So some of these factors could be related to speakers, some of these could be related to listening, listening context, and some of these could be related to listeners' background. Um, so the overarching question that began, um, the, started the whole entire process for me was this question, how do listeners perceive speech and judge an accent in the presence of visual information? Um, and if you delve into this literature, you will see that a lot of folks um, try to focus on um, showing pictures, showing videos, and whether these could help or um, interfere with um, understanding of speech. And you will see that there are conflicting results, that in some cases it helps listeners to understand speech, and in some cases it does not. So then I felt the um, need to update my question to how do listeners with more or less diverse social networks perceive and judge colonized English varieties in the presence of visual information. Now, why is this update necessary? Well, it is necessary because it's we, we actually lack a lot of um, literature or colonized um, English varieties in the field of linguistics. If you look into linguistic anthropology, you get to find more um, um, research on this topic, but in linguistics, and particularly in auditory sciences and intersection of psycholinguistics, we do not get to find information on colonized English varieties. And also, I wanted to focus on listeners and not speakers and try to find out what makes listeners understand speech when presented, uh, when accompanied with visual information. So all of these are relevant because we know that language and social identity are intertwined and language has been acknowledged as the um, a group identity marker. Um, the minute that you say that you speak X language, you automatically ingroup yourself with um, speakers of that language. And this is fine because discrimination as a general cognitive tool is very useful. We know this from color perception. We know this from other visual studies. But discrimination as a tool to marginalize groups of individuals is what we find problematic because then we see negative attitudes and um, how those folks actually um, have trouble navigating everyday life. And working uh, social psychology and racial linguistics also suggests that race marks group identity as well. And race can also shape the way that language dynamics work. So some languages and varieties are more racialized than others. And um, as a result, these racial linguistic ideologies shape the way that we form our linguistic theories, um, linguistic practices, and it's all governed by this um, concept of whiteness. So as a result, I wanted to delve into that colonial practices and how colonial practices actually led to the emergence of many Englishes. Because if you look at, for instance, these three varieties of English as British English, American English, and Indian English, you get to see that these do not hold the same status because Indian English emerged as a result of British colonialism, but American English did not. So when we group or when we put these three varieties all together in a speech perception study, the way that individuals engage with these varieties are important because those also reflect racial linguistic ideologies. Because again, it is stereotypically known that British English is still perceived as the most prestigious variety, um, if, if um, aside from the most familiar variety. 
All right, so aside from that, we also know that colonial Englishes, when they're emerging, they're emerging outside of this multilingual practices. And combined with their multilingual nature, we actually see that speakers of racialized colonized varieties do not have access to equal work opportunities, education, and benefits of multi being a multilingual. And why, again, is this important? It's important because our linguistic theories are bombarded by, by whether being a bilingual or multilingual have cognitive advantages, for instance, um, when compared to monolinguals. But then when we look at the colonized varieties of Englishes or other type of um, languages, we disregard the majority of bi and multilinguals who suffer on a daily basis with these monolithic expectations of speaking without an accent. So therefore, the study of speech perception of colonized varieties in the presence of visual information is a study of understanding multilingual realities in our global world. So in the current studies, um, I will be showing you how listeners' intelligibility, which is the ability to type down sentences, and their accent misjudgments, which is the subjective perception of judging one's accent, towards these three varieties, one being Indian English, the other um, one being British and American English, um, are shaped by using a match guys technique. I prefer this technique because it's been um, used in majority of language additive research. It's it can be modified in experimental linguistics, um, and also it can give me that visual information aspect. And I, I combined with this um, match guys technique, but the um, examination of listener social environment by using a social network questionnaire. So three research questions. Does race impact speech perception of different varieties of English? Does the variety type make a difference? So hearing these um, three varieties, are there any differences? And does participants' racial diversity in their social network impact their judgments and intelligibility? Um, so as the, aside from the match guys technique, which I will be showing you in a second, um, participants did language back, they completed a language background questionnaire, which gave me all the information about their um, background, their status of bilingualism, and by the way, all participants were bilinguals, there was no monolingual control group here, um, and they completed the social network questionnaire um, where we looked at their tight network. So it's a, around eight people and whether within that eight people, they do have individuals who belong to another racial group. Um, and if they do have that other racial group, we group them under a more diverse group. And if they do not have um, that um, diversity, we group them under racially less diverse. And after completing those two tasks, they also did the intelligibility and accentedness, which looks something like this. So on the left side, you're looking at intelligibility task, and on the right side, you're looking at the accentedness task. Um, they, per, first of all, they saw a fixation cross just to alert them that the stimulus is um, coming up. And then after that, they saw either a white face or a South Asian face. All faces came from previous to control databases, um, previous to normalized databases, basically. And then they heard either American English, British English, or Indian English. And again, um, these sentences were also previously normed um, and checked for their intelligibility. So everything was normed before this um, task, basically. And then after that, they were asked to type down the sentence for intelligibility task. And for the accent in this task, they were asked to judge whether the person had an accent or not. If they believe that the person didn't have an accent, they can go all the way up, uh, down to number one. Um, if they believe that the person had an accent, they can go all the way up to nine. So we did test 58 participants um, at the University of Florida. Um, all of these were undergraduate students, um, and the mean age was um, around 19 years of age. Um, and the intellig only we um, pre-processed the intelligibility data because um, that was the transcription. Some participants typed down what they heard. And we wanted to only count lexical words because this is what has been done in previous intelligibility research. So if the sentence was, for instance, the color of a lemon is yellow, we only looked at the transcription accuracy of color, lemon, and yellow. Um, the coding was done uh, via three different research assistants coding each of these sentences and making sure that uh, participants type those um, words, the lexical items, um, correctly. And then we also wanted to just run everything through a run, uh, an R string matching script where um, R basically looked at whether the uh, what research assistants did actually correlate with the what participants um, typed down. And if the, again, participants type something correctly, they'll get one, a score of one. And if they did it incorrectly, they get a score of zero. And then we converted those to proportions and everything was entered into a mixed effect model. So I'll show you the proportions, intelligibility proportions first, and then I will move on to the accent misjudgments. 
Um, so if you look at the left side, you'll see racially less diverse group. And on the right side, you'll see racially more diverse group. And on the top, you'll see the ends for each group. And for each graph that I will be showing from now on, the leftmost will be American English, the middle one is going to be British English, and the, the rightmost one will be Indian English for both sides, left and right. And within each um, variety group, the left will be South Asian faces and the right will be white faces. So by just looking at these graphs quickly, you can see that whenever we switch faces from a South Asian face to a white face, participants intelligibility increase um, for each variety. So it happened for American English, it happened for British English, it happened for Indian English, it happened for both groups, both racially less diverse and more diverse. It happened uh, for Indian English at a greater extent compared to British English and compared to American English. Okay, so there were no group differences. The only difference was the face type. So whether they're seeing South Asian face or white face and whether they were listening to American English, British English or Indian English. Now let's look at accent, this judgments. Again, remember one was no accent whatsoever, nine being heavily accented. Um, participants, when they saw a South Asian face, um, accompanied with an American English, they judged it as more accented compared to when they heard the exact same stimuli with a white face. Okay, same thing happened for British English for racial less diverse group. It did not happen for Indian English. It was not significant, but the, the direction was in the same way. Okay, so for racially more diverse group, something else happened for American English. It was the same effect. We did get the face effect of um, switching from South Asian face to a white face. For British English, that effect disappeared. So there was no face effect for British English. And for Indian English, the same effect of, um, that we observed in American English came back. Okay, so um, when you look at, when you compare Indian English present with white faces, you get to see that racially more diverse group judge them less accented compared to racial less diverse group. This yellow bar is um, higher than this one. And also within racially more diverse group, um, they judge Indian English presented with white faces as less accented compared to Indian English presented with South Asian faces. So these are very challenging um, concepts because we found that no matter what happens, the variety when we presented that with South Asian faces, basically individuals um, intelligibility scores were impacted and they were judged as being more accented. And when we presented the same stimuli with white faces, intelligibility went up and again, the accentedness went down. So we wanted to replicate these results just to make sure that what we're dealing with as social diversity in Gainesville, Florida can be actually expanded to more urban areas because Gainesville, Florida is a college town, it's a small town, and even our racially more diverse group folks had a lot of white folks in their social network. So we really wanted to see what's actually happening here. So to expand this research a little bit, we wanted to test a multilingual, multicultural context, um, and we conducted the exact same study in Gainesville one more time, and we did it um, in Montreal, Canada. So we tested 25 participants in both locations. Now, Montreal, Canada is very important to look at because first of all, um, Montreal is a bilingual city, um, but aside from being a bilingual city, there are a bunch of different neighborhoods where you get to see uh, folks from different multilingual um, backgrounds practicing their languages. So here, instead of using social network, we wanted to use this language entropy score to measure that what, what we're looking at as bilingual groups are actually homogenous or heterogeneous. So we just wanted to see what's actually happening when we compare Montreal to Florida in terms of their linguistic diversity. So this language entropy is, a, is an R package that you all um, can use easily if you have a language background questionnaire data. Um, and it looks at the diversity of language use. If um, you get a score below 0 0.5, you're more on the side of you're a bilingual, but you only use one language predominantly in everyday life. If you have a score higher than 0 0.5, you're more balanced bilingual that you use both languages at the same time. So if you look at Florida language entropy, which is on the left, you get to see that folks are actually more monolingual-like, right? So they're bilinguals, and we're looking at English-Spanish bilinguals here, uh, but they tend to use English more often um, than using English and Spanish at the same time, which we expected because, again, Gainesville is a college town and there's not much of an um, integration of English and Spanish in, in our um, town. 
Whereas if you look at Montreal, you get to see two peaks, which suggests that you get to find bilinguals who tend to be more monolingual-like, but also bilinguals who resume to continue or who continue using their both of their languages in their everyday life. So that's that two peak that's telling us. So what did we find? Well, basically for gains, we'll be we replicated what we found in the previous um, study. Whenever we switch um, faces from a South Asian face to a white face, immediately the intelligibility um, scores went up for all varieties and it happened again for Indian English. If you look at Montreal data, I'm sorry, it's, it's all um, squished there. Uh, I just wanted to keep the proportion um, the, the same on the same scale. But basically in Montreal, there's no effect whatsoever for faces and for variety. Basically participants heard the sentences, they typed those down, had no issues. And again, this was expected because remember, we normed these sentences before. So these were all control sentences that we expected them to be highly intelligible. If you look at accent, this judgments on the other hand, again, we replicated the Gainesville results from the previous Gainesville um, data set that whenever we switch from a South Asian face to a white face, the um, accent and judgments decrease. Um, but for Montreal, the face effect was not there. So there is no difference between a South, seeing a South Asian face versus a white face on the screen. But we did get the variety effect that American English was judged less compared to British English and um, Indian English was judged the highest in terms of accent. So we had this step by um, step increase from American English to Indian English. Now, what are we looking at here? Well, first of all, both faces and the variety type impact intelligibility and accent judgments. And living in more diverse social networks or locations where we get to see multilingualism or multiculturalism, that also does impact intelligibility and accent judgments. But I want you to take this, um, the next step, uh, the next bullet point as a take home message. Even though in more diverse environments such as Montreal or individuals who have more racial diversity in their social networks, we get this effect of um, colonized variety being judged as the most accented. Okay, so no matter what happens, Indian English was always judged as highly accented and the intelligibility scores went down whenever we brought in South Asian faces. Now, what does this all mean? Well, the previous research on speech perception primarily focused on speakers, what we can do to help speakers to pronounce things more native-like, right? Um, recently, there's this push towards understanding listener's side, but maybe we really need to focus more on listeners, not on speaker aspect, just because when we look at listeners coming from diverse um, backgrounds, we get to see these differences. But we should always also keep in mind that not every variety is the same. Um, and this also has a lot of implications for, um, for instance, labeling Indian English as non-native accent, which I have um, seen in excuse me, I have seen in the majority of experimental linguistic research. So our interpretation of accent and judgments and intelligibility tasks and their reliability really depends on who we are testing, when we are testing, and what is the racial linguistic context. And these have been the critical issues that have been avoided in the past research. So as a field, we really should do better in terms of the, the, the terminology that we are using. And aside from the terminology that we are using, identifying the colon colonial history um, on how it shaped basically the way that we use language and the way that we created our experimental tools and analysis. Thank you so much. I think I'm over, not over time, but um, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you for that. Uh, fantastic talk. I see a raised hand from uh, Sarah Phillips at NYU. Uh, please, um, I'm going to see if I can let you ask a question. Sorry, I, can I see? I, I cannot see. I'm trying to get there. Okay, I see. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you see it. I see it now. Um, if you're ready for it, uh, I'm going to pass to, to Sarah Phillips. I just have hit allowed to talk. Absolutely. Oh, hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. How are you on the line? 
Um, thank you so much. Uh, this is very interesting and, and I think very relevant to some of the work that I'm also doing with, with bilinguals. Um, I was actually um, interested in how your results might also compare with work that's also been done in our department by Becky Laternas, who found that people were uh, able to better interpret um, expressions from different uh, identities over time. So mm -hmm. if someone was perceived as accented, maybe they would have an, in, uh, an easier time. So I was wondering to learn a little bit more about the design because I, I did come into the session late. So I don't know if you did like a blocked or a randomized design um, and seeing whether or not you would see effects over the course of the study. Yes. So uh, thank you so much for that question. So I'll, I'll go back right here. To, oops, can I? Yeah, I can. Okay. So um, I hope you can see, but these were the, the design. So basically seeing the faces and then listening to sentences, um, all of this was Latin squared. So um, they will see throughout the entire experiment, which was 120 sentences, which is fairly short, um, but we wanted to see very like basically no adaptation because if um, we go over 120 sentences, we were afraid that, well, what if they get used to um, the accents, which will take the study into a complete different direction. But there are folks, and yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. There are folks who show that within lab training um, from the beginning of the study to the end of study, so within like two, two and a half hours, folks actually get better at understanding. For this study, we did not find any um, difference from the beginning um, or the first part of the study to the second part of the study. But because they were also randomized, so we didn't block the accents, but we randomize them within the entire list. Um, that was just like, we didn't find any um, change from the beginning to the second part, basically. But th that is very accurate because, again, if you look at, let me go back to here, um, from Montreal participants right here. Um, so presumably Montreal folks are more um, um, linguistically trained about different varieties because um, if you look at the Canadian Canadian census, they get to hear more diverse um, speech on an everyday basis or a regular basis. So they have a basically ceiling effect, right? So um, Gainesville folks do not have that well because they may not be familiar with Indian English or British English, but then it is really strange to see this and this here. So um, I think if we happen to have a longer experiment, I will definitely um, predict seeing some adaptation. Um, but just because we had a very short period of time uh, when we we're testing participants, we didn't get that training effect. And I hope I answered your question. You did, thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. Uh, all right, I see another hand up. Um, for those of you who, who missed the very beginning of this session, I am uh, surprise chairing, so I'm still getting my, my sea legs together. Um, but I see a hand up from uh, Alicia Wassink. So if you can introduce yourself, your organization, and your pronouns, uh, and then share your question. And I think, here you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, I'm Alicia Wasink, University of Washington, Seattle. She, her pronouns. Thank you for a great talk, Ethan. Um, I you. am also doing some work looking at social networks um, and uh, the types of diversity that we see within those. And I wanted just to ask a clarification question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the social network questionnaire that you used? Because it sounded like you were looking at close tie networks um, but rather than looking at diversity of network globally, like an ethnic homophily score, it looked like you were looking at diversity with regard to the varieties that uh, you were actually targeting. Um, did I understand that correctly? And yes, if not, yes. could you clarify? That is, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. So I did use Levarius 2017 social network question, which is a very short um, social network questionnaire where you get um, seven to eight questions um, asking folks how many people they engage in on a weekly basis, um, their age, um, their, um, yes, their first their age, their closeness to the person. Um, and I added the race component, so what their race was. Um, and then I also asked for their ethnicity as well. Um, but for the weekly basis, aside from like how many people they engage in on a, a weekly basis, 
I also had another question where it asked whether they are close within the closed network, which is we gave them the um, the number of eight to ten people. Um, how of how how many of those folks belong to um, a racial and ethnic group that is not that is not their own racial and ethnic group? If I'm not sure. If I, mean, I see. Yeah. So I we wanted to. Yeah, we, we wanted to basically just focus on their tight network because. Um, we did a norming study before this, and when we asked them about their um, entire social network, um, we got some people saying that, oh, they interact with 50 people, and then some people said 150 people on a weekly basis. Um, but then we asked them about, well, how close are you with those people? They'll just say, oh, no, this is just my classmate and this and that person. So they do not engage with those folks um, in any linguistic um, scheme, basically. So then we changed the question to, well, in your closed network, um, who are those people? And then we are actually preparing another um, social network questionnaire that we just designed um, from scratch for basically Montreal folks. Um, and we collected that data and that's a little bit, a little bit larger than what we did here, basically. Okay, and so one interesting thing I think might be to also look at maybe the um, the baseline demography of the community itself, because uh -huh. the type of diversity that's actually inherent to the community might uh, not look the same as what people can do to select among a diverse set of individuals for their own personal network. Absolutely, yeah, that's a that's a great point because so that's one of the um, pros and cons of doing the testing in Gainesville actually. So we do actually have a very diverse um, student population here, but what we observe is that they are segregated from each other. So we have, for instance, a very large Indian English speaker population on campus, but they're not integrated with all other students basically. So we that with the social network question, we wanted to target whether we can actually see that segregation. And unfortunately we did document that segregation that even the individuals who are from coming from different racial and ethnic um, backgrounds, they are overwhelmingly stated that they interact with mostly white folks. So there's this dominance of um, in the, in, on the entire campus that there's the white folks and there's other folks who interact with white folks and then there are other um, individuals who are more multilingual, multicultural. And that's the reason why we also wanted to do the Montreal one because the baseline of Montreal is diverse from um, the beginning, but again, we didn't find any effects for Indian English, which was um, very unfortunate and surprising, to be honest. That's great. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there, we, we have just another minute if there are any other short questions. And otherwise, we can all take a second, catch our breath, and get ready for the next talk. All right, I don't see any raised hands and we have one minute, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you for that uh, very much. Uh, again, this was um, <clears throat> Ethan Kutlu. I, I did not ask beforehand because I'm <laughs> surprised you're hearing, so I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please don't hesitate to correct me. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you again for that talk. Uh, our next talk is going to be resumptive pronouns facilitate processing of long distance relative clause dependencies in second language English. Um, and that is, I just lost my window here. That is from Fred Zinker at the University of Hawaii. So thank you and you have the floor. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Fred, and my uh, talk today is on resumptive pronouns in second language English. So first of all, the term resumption refers to the situation where a pronoun or a noun phrase occupies the gap position in what would otherwise be a filler gap dependency. It's common in L2 production, especially in relative clauses. The example given here was produced by an L1 Korean L2 learner of English. It reads, sometimes I typed an article, a noun, an adjective, or an adverb that I thought it would fit into the context. The it here is a resumptive pronoun, or RP for short. The grammatical version of this sentence with a filler gap dependency would be, sometimes I typed an article, a noun, an adjective, or an adverb that I thought would fit into the context. And in this example, the gap is the empty syntactic position at the foot of the dependency. The interesting thing about L2 resumption in RCs 
is that it occurs even when it's ungrammatical in both the first language and the target language. And in these cases, it can't be easily traced to either uh, transfer uh, or input. So this table shows the distribution of gaps and resumptive pronouns in Hebrew, English, and Korean, according to Keenan and Comrie. Hebrew has grammatical resumption in a variety of syntactic positions, uh, but notice that the two languages involved in today's study, English and Korean, are highly restricted in their use of resumptive pronouns. I should note here as well that uh, there's ongoing debate about the exact distribution of resumptive pronouns in Korean, but the judgments of my Korean language consultants align very well with uh, the pattern shown in table one, both for short distance and long distance relativization. Now, previous research on resumption in L1 English has found that RPs receive low acceptability ratings across conditions, uh, both in positions that are accessible um, to gaps and in those that are inaccessible to gaps as well, namely syntactic islands. And recent uh, psycholinguistic studies have also found that resumptive pronouns show clear signs of being easier to process than gaps in certain environments that are difficult for rel relativization. Uh, this suggests that English resumption represents an ungrammatical processing strategy. And this type of resumption is some kind of, sometimes called intrusive resumption to distinguish it from the grammatical resumption that we see in languages like Hebrew. Uh, one of these studies, Hoffmeister and Norcliffe 2013, helped to inspire the design for the current study. It used an online self-paced reading task and an offline acceptability judgment task to tease apart processing strategies from grammatical representations. Both of them had a two by two experimental design crossing dependency length, short versus long, and dependency type, gap versus resumptive pronoun. Uh, here's an example item shown in the four critical conditions that they used. These sentences are considerably longer and more difficult than the ones used in the current study. On the self-paced reading task, reading times were shorter in the long RP condition than in all competing conditions. Uh, both at the RP region and at the spillover region following the gap or resumptive pronoun. On the acceptability judgment task, though, there were consistently low ratings for RPs across conditions. This suggests that RPs can facilitate processing even if the resulting sentences are unacceptable. So where might this processing facilitation come from? For production, it's been suggested that RPs give speakers a means of maintaining co-reference when a filler gap uh, dependency breaks down, thus allowing them to continue their message without breaking the production chain. For comprehension, uh, the RP supplies an overt marker of the location of the foot of the dependency, which would otherwise need to be inferred. And depending on the language and the context, the RP may also provide information about case, gender, number, et cetera, that further aids with dependency resolution. Previous research on L2 resumption has shown that it is one more common in positions thought to be difficult for relativization, uh, two more prevalent in lower level learners than higher level ones, and three produced regardless of whether it is grammatical in the L1 and the TL. Hilton Stomp's uh, L2 study on uh, Swedish resumption has, uh, was the first to show that L2 are systematically produced resumptive pronouns in RCs, even when they are ungrammatical in both the first language and the target language. He hypothesized that L2 resumption represents a strategy for reducing processing load. Uh, this seems like a reasonable enough proposal to make because there's good evidence that processing is slower and more labored in an L2 than in a native language. Uh, however, it hasn't been thoroughly tested using psycholinguistic methods. So the current study aims to address this gap in the research by testing whether resumption in subject relative clauses represents a processing strategy and or um, interlanguage grammar representations for L1 Korean L2 words of English. It uses a series of online and offline tasks to tease apart processing strategies from grammatical representations. And one possibility here is that L2 resumption facilitates processing despite being unacceptable, which would indicate that it represents an ungrammatical processing strategy, just like L in an L1 English. However, if participants systematically accept resumptive uh, relative clauses in one or more conditions in both the offline judgment task as shown in scenario two um, or in scenario three here, it would suggest that resumption is an acceptable option for relativization in the learner's interlanguage grammar. 
So far, I've collected data from a test group consisting of 29 L1 Korean L2 learners of English and a control group consisting of 25 native English speakers. In addition to the main tasks, each participant also completes a C test as a measure of English proficiency. The C test scores indicate that the L2ers are mostly high intermediate to advanced learners of English and all participants completed all tasks except for six native speakers who didn't receive the production task. So during the experimental session, participants first do a language background questionnaire, and then they proceed to a relative elicitation task designed to test uh, the processing of gaps and resumptive pronouns during RC production. Then they do a self-paced reading task, testing the processing of gaps in RPs during RC comprehension. Then they do an offline judgment task, testing the acceptability of the sentence types used on the self-paced reading task. And finally, they do the C-test as a measure of English proficiency. I collected the data for this study over the internet with JotForm and Ibex Farm, and performed all of the data analyses and plotting in R. So let's start by looking at the elicited production task. It has eight critical items distributed across two conditions in a Latin square design alongside 12 fillers. The stimuli uh, elicit relativization from monoclausal and biclausal sentences. So for the short condition, an example of a target response is the boy that Gap or he will win the race. And in the long condition, an example is the boy that Mary thinks Gap or he will win the race. The sentences used in all the tasks were relatively short and simple, so I didn't expect that the native speakers would have trouble with them. However, I did predict that some of the l 2 might struggle with the long condition. At the beginning of each trial, the participant sees pictures of two people along with sentences describing them. And on the following screen, one of the sentences is replaced with a question that uh, prompts participants to identify the person in the picture. For this trial, the target response would be the boy that Mary thinks Gap or he will win the race. Participants who simply repeat 50% or more of test sentences are excluded from analysis. And this resulted in the removal of four native speakers and two l 2 from the data collected so far, uh, leaving 15 native speakers and 27 l 2 for analysis. This figure shows the mean proportions for each response type organized by condition. For the native speakers, virtually all of the responses were of the gap type for both the short and the long conditions. For the L2ers though, uh, although all of the short condition responses were of the gap type, uh, in the long condition, only 60% were of the gap type. And the remaining responses consisted of resumptive relative clauses, that's 8%, and other non-target responses, that's 31%. Uh, logistic, uh, mixed effects model analysis did not detect a significant effect of condition on the rates of uh, gap responses for either group. This was likely due to the combination of low power and uh, high rates of inter-participant variability. For example, only 52% of the l 2 had any non-gap responses at all in either condition. And also only 19% of the l 2 had responses of the RP type. Uh, still, these results suggest that at least some of the l 2 had trouble relativizing from embedded clauses and that they resorted to resumption and other circumvention techniques when confronted with this task. Now let's move on to the self-paced reading task. Like the one in Hoffmeister and Norcliffe study, it had a two by two design crossing dependency length, short versus long, and dependency type, gap versus RP. There are 24 critical items and 36 fillers, half grammatical, half ungrammatical. Uh, the example item given here for the short conditions reads, Mary thinks that uh, that is the boy that Gap or he will win the race. And then the long conditions, the sentence reads, uh, that is the boy that Mary thinks Gap or he will win the race. Sentences are presented in moving window format with word by word segmentation. At the beginning of a trial, participants see a series of dashes, and as they press the space bar, they advance through the sentence one word at a time. In this paradigm, reading times, or RTs, uh, for each word are recorded and analyzed, and um, longer RTs are associated with processing difficulty. Also, each stimulus is followed by a two-choice comprehension question to make sure that participants are paying attention. Also, like Hoffmeister and Norcliffe, I define the critical region as the two words following the gap or resumptive pronoun. 
for data cleaning, uh, reading times longer than three seconds are shorter than 200 milliseconds were excluded from analysis. And RTs more than two standard deviations above the mean for any condition by region combination were replaced with that cutoff value. All participants so far have had at least 80% accuracy on the comprehension questions. So I haven't made any uh, exclusions for participants not paying attention. This figure shows the mean reading times plotted out for each condition. Already we can see that the L2ers have very long reading times in the long gap con uh, condition at the critical region. Um, to investigate the results further, I performed a linear mixed effects regression analysis on the data for each group. For the native speakers, there was no significant uh, effect for length or type, but the interaction between the two was significant. For the l tours, there was a significant effect for length and a marginally significant one for type in the interaction term was significant. So because of these uh, uh, significant interaction effects, I proceeded to pairwise comparisons on the data in the short and long environments. This figure shows the mean reading times in the short environment. For the native speakers, there was a significant effect of type with RP trials having slower reading times than gap trials. This indicates that if anything, the RP these made processing slightly harder in the short environment, perhaps due to a surprisal effect. For the L2ers though, there was no significant difference between the conditions. The data tell a different story in the long environment. For the native speakers, there was no significant difference between RTs in the two conditions, but for the L2ers, there was a significant effect of type with gap trials having slower RTs than RP trials. This indicates that the l 2 had more difficulty with gaps than RPs in the long environment. This figure shows the mean accuracy rates for the comprehension questions plotted out by condition. There were two types of comprehension questions, both of which um, were design, formulated in an attempt to require accurate resolution of the RC dependency. Uh, logistic mix effects regression analysis didn't uh, detect the significant effect of length, type, or their interaction on the response accuracy. And like in the production data, this is likely due to the high rates of inter-participant variability. Inspection of individual um, participant results, though, showed that um, about a third of participants in each group contributed to the pattern we see here, where in the long environment, uh, gaps had lower accuracy scores on average than the uh, RP trials. Uh, these data suggest uh, that participants successfully associated presumptive pronouns with the head NP of the relative clause and that at least some of them had trouble with gaps but not RPs in the long environment. Now let's take a look at the results from the acceptability judgment test. So the design for this task was the same as that for the self-paced reading task, except that different lexicalizations were used. Uh, sentences were rating on a, rated on a one to six scale with an additional off-scale I don't know option. And prior to analysis, the raw ratings were converted to z-scores to reduce scale bi bias. Also, I don't know responses were excluded from analysis. In this case, that was 0% of responses. So here's an example trial showing the stimulus sentence along with the rating scale and some helping text. This figure shows the mean z-score ratings plotted out for each condition. We can see that both groups have higher ratings for uh, gaps than for RPs across both environments. To examine the acceptance rates further, I conducted a linear mixed effects regression analysis for each group. The results show that there was a significant effect for length for the L2ers, but only a marginal one for the native speakers. However, both groups had a significant effect of type showing that they rated gaps uh, significantly higher than resumptive pronouns. Finally, the interaction between the variables was not significant for either group, uh, suggesting that the degree to which they favored gaps over RPs didn't vary significantly across the two environments. To investigate whether performance uh, for the L2ers was modulated by proficiency. I performed a linear regression analysis on their data, uh, comparing their different scores in the long environment to their proficiency scores from the C-test. These different scores were calculated by taking the participant's mean Z-score in the long gap condition and subtracting his or her mean Z-score in the long RP condition. The relationship was significant. Um, indicating that acceptance rates for RPs are modulated by proficiency. 
Now onto the discussion. Okay, let's start by summarizing the findings for the native speakers. For the online tasks, uh, there was little or no evidence that RPs facilitate processing. And this was expected because the sentences were relatively short and simple in this experiment. For the acceptability judgment task, there were consistently low ratings for RPs across conditions. This is consistent with earlier research showing that resumption is not an acceptable option for relativization in L1 English. Moving on to the L tours, at least some of the individuals resorted to resumption or circumvention to avoid relativizing from embedded clauses on the elicited production task. And on the self-paced reading task, there was evidence that l find gaps more difficult than RPs in long distance relative clause environments. Uh, these findings from the processing tasks are consistent with Hilton Stom's claim that RPs uh, facilitate processing in an L2. And on the acceptability judgment task, there were low ratings for RPs across conditions, but a proficiency effect was also detected whereby uh, some low proficiency individuals tended to accept uh, resumptive pronouns uh, more than gaps in the long environment. Um, and for this, more data collection is needed to determine whether RPs are truly part of the IL grammar for low proficiency L tours or not. Okay, one of this study's limitations is low statistical power. Um, subsequent analysis with of the current data set with the SIMR package in R suggests that at least 60 participants per group are, well, will be needed to achieve adequate power for all the tasks. And this problem can be addressed by testing more participants. Uh, a second limitation is that there was insufficient range of proficiency levels, which makes it hard to determine how proficiency modulates performance on the tasks. This can be addressed with uh, more targeted participant recruitment. And third, there was too much variability in the age of onset and not all the uh, l tours could be categorized as adult learners. Some of them were uh, child learners. And unless we plan to compare early and late learners in our analysis, uh, it would be better to limit participation to those who started learning English at uh, no younger than age eight or 10. Um, and finally, I only tested l tours uh, in English, which means that we don't know for certain how they would have performed in their native language, Korean. This is important because we're assuming here that the l performance can't be traced to L1 transfer. Uh, we can address this problem in the future by testing l in both of their languages. All right, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me with this project. And buzzing through the references, thank you for listening too. Thank you for that fantastic talk. Um, we are in just uh, just over a minute early, so we have plenty of time for mm -hmm. questions. Uh, I'll go back into this. Uh, feel free to raise hand or type question in the Q and A. We have ten minutes for questions. I think you wowed them. Um, I have just a quick question while other people are formulating their thoughts. Um, do you have an idea of what you would expect uh, from uh, the L the L1 performance for Korean speakers um, that you want to talk that you wanted to test um, a little bit uh, later on? Do you have an idea of what what you might expect to see there? Um, sure. So based on the little bit of experimental research that's been done, um, I would expect. Um, low ratings across the board for uh, resumptive pronouns in these types of dependencies. Um, but it's interesting, I just recently did some piloting um, on a similar task to this with Korean speakers, uh, giving them acceptability judgment tasks in both English and Korean. And this was with um, direct object relative clauses instead of subject relative clauses. And in the uh, low, in, in the short environment, there was a big difference um, where uh, the gaps were, got very ratings and the results got very low ratings 
um, and in the other environments that I tested, a long environment, and also in this case, um, a syntactic island environment, a WH island environment, the uh, ratings for resumptive pronouns were still below the second, the, the center line of my rating scale, but uh, quite a bit higher than in the first condition. So that suggests that, um, uh, that at least in some environments, um, uh, resumptive pronouns might be more acceptable in, for native speakers of Korean than they are for native speakers of English. And meanwhile, interestingly, these were pretty um, um, high level learners. On the English task, they performed exactly like we would expect um, native English speakers to with uniformly low ratings for resumptive pronouns across the board. Sorry, I don't have that figure for you. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. All right, with that, I'm going to open the questions up to the rest of the floor. Okay. The rest of the attendees, I'm still imagining uh, uh, physical space that we're all in. Mm. And I see some hands going up. Uh, I, I put my hand up if, if no one else has a question. Um, sure, thanks, Christopher. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm curious. So that eight percent uh, that produced mm -hmm. the result. I'm curious if what kind of what the distribution of that was. Was it kind of spread equally across the participants, or were there some people that were kind of uh, gung ho about RPs and, and represented that eight percent? Um, yeah, just curious about the distribution there. Right, it, it was coming from 19% um, of the l tours who participated in the study so far. Yeah, and for those participants, um, some of them uh, did resumption in 100% of the long environment trials, and, um, and some of them did it as low as 25%. And remember here, there were only, for this task, um, there were only uh, four items per condition, so. Uh, Right. Yeah, can't get can't get Although, lower than twenty five percent without it being zero percent. Right. <laughs> True. Yeah. All right. While uh, we wait for some other hands to go up, I have another quick question for you, which is, um, you mentioned that there was uh, eight percent there, and then there was thirty percent that was other. Can you speak a little bit to um, what some of the other was a little bit more? Sure, yeah, in some cases, um, people modified the structure of the dependency to make it a uh, short distance uh, relativ relativization instead of long distance relativization. So saying things like, um, this is the boy that won the race according to Mary. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one type of response that we got. And then um, also included in there were some sentence uh, repetitions repetitions of the test sentence. So yeah, in my fu future data collection, because um, I did have quite a few participants who um, just repeated the test sentence all the time. Um, I think that I'll have an expanded um, training phase with more practice items and that should help to get them used to the format of, of the exercise so that they give the intended kind of response. We still have another five minutes for questions. I see a good 18 people here. I couldn't ask another one. Um, so I'm so the tasks. This was like one session, and the tasks were like right after um, the others. How was or was it the same groups of pe people 
um, that did it over time or just to, because Yeah, all yeah, of the participants did all of the tasks. Okay, and yeah. Let me go back to this slide. And uh, they did it all in the same session. Yeah. Yep. The order makes kind of makes sense to me uh, right. that you do kind of the production first as to not prime them. Um, it's kind of a cool, exactly. I think. Yeah, and the yeah, acceptability yeah. judgments last so that they're not thinking of the sentences in terms of acceptability when they're doing the processing tasks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice design. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Can you move? I, so there were a couple of slides that I found interesting that I was hoping to have a, another second to look at. And oh, sure. since nobody is preventing me from asking this, um, can you go to, um, oh, I can see all of them now. Can you go to um, I think examples for, I believe it was the second task. Um, okay, the self case reading. Okay. Just, yeah, and then the next slide. I can start going through. Yeah. Yeah, give me one second here. Back one. I can just. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh no, sorry. I'm. It's there was another where you had examples of the of the conditions for one of the tasks. And I couldn't remember if it was task two or three, um, but I think it was not this slide. So let's let's keep them going. Mm -hmm. And attendees, yeah. at any point, if you have a question that you feel is more interesting than me <laughs> asking to see the slide that I want to see, feel free to raise a hand, and we will give you the floor. Yeah, the conditions were the same for. Um, for oh. test two and test three. That would. So it would have been these example great. sentences. <laughs> Might it have been um, the first task, the elicitation task? I think you're actually, yes. Had slightly different conditions. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, Oh, I see. Give me one second. I see a question in the Q and A. Sure. So let me get that. Um, uh, so I'm going to. Uh, I don't know if you can see the question, but it is. I'm sorry if I missed something. But what did you use as fillers? Mm hmm. Okay. So for uh, this task, they were um, a range of uh, monoclausal and biclausal sentences that all had um, that all elicited a uh, short distance rel relativization even for the biclausal sentences mm -hmm. and um, and I used similar ones for I think that I might have a bonus slide on this at the bottom let me see mm. here we go the other tasks the filler types, yeah, there were two types. Mary met a boy, uh, that or which says he will watch a movie, watch the movie. And this is the girl that says John should deliver or delivers the letter. So the grammatical and ungrammatical variants for each type. All right, um, mm -hmm. we have one more minute. So thank you for that. Um, absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to now move on to our last and final talk in this session, which is Processing Obviation in Border Lakes Ojibwe by Christopher Hamley at UMass Amherst. Uh, you <laughs> have the con and the floor. <laughs> Got to unmute myself. So I'm actually, so LSA schedule says UMass. I'm now at University of Minnesota, um, proudly. Just a quick correction there. So just one moment. And all right, that should be seeable. All right, well, thanks everyone for um, staying at least here in Minnesota. It is um, seven o'clock, so getting a little late for a Saturday. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, I'm gonna be um, talking about obviation in Border Lakes to Ojibwe, a processing study. Um, and I wanna start with the basic empirical definition um, 
uh, that underpins the main topic of today's talk, which is person-based prominence effects. So this is basically the observation that certain person categories are privileged by the grammar. Um, and it's generally encoded, um, uh, at least descriptively, as uh, ranking person categories on a hierarchy or scale. Um, and that's shown here with first or second, the local persons being ranked over um, proximate, which is ranked over obviative, um, which is ranked over animate. I'll get to that distinction between um, proximate and obviative in a moment. Um, and basically this is a way of describing the observation that, um, for example, often first and second person will be privileged over all the other third persons in ways that I'll turn to in a moment. So with this, we can ask the question, how might this prominence information, so this ranking, um, be used in processing, and in particular, in the processing of Ojibwe? Um, but first, I want to get kind of all on the same page about the grammatical effects that we see um, uh, coming from these scales. OK, so as we saw on the scale on the last side, Ojibwe splits what other language would have as just the animate third persons into two different categories. And one is a third person that's elevated to this role that we call proximate. And you can think of this as being the person that's in the spotlight. Um, and the other one is the uh, person that's are all the people that are obviative. Um, and that's kind of everybody else that's still on stage, but not the main character. So what kind of particular person or referent uh, takes this role is a little bit complex. Uh, it has to do with point of view and other discourse prominence factors. Um, for today, what's important is just knowing that there's this, this split between the two and that there's a ranking. Um, and so what is the observed effect of this, or is of this ranking? So in cases where proximate is acting on obviative, we get this direct agreement marker ah, um, and we can call this a direct alignment. So we're seeing the higher ranked proximate argument uh, take on the higher ranked agent thematic role and then vice versa for obviative and patient. So on the other hand, if obviative is acting on proximate, we get the inverse agreement marker, that's uh, igu here. And uh, we can characterize this as an inverse alignment where our higher ranked proximate argument is being associated with a lower ranked um, patient thematic role. So we can schematize this um, kind of nicely with these, these diagrams here. So what a lot of uh, work, especially over recent years, um, has Kind of gotten a handle on is what are the representations and grammatical mechanisms that underlie these direct inverse agreement systems. So essentially, why do these different morphemes pop up under these different conditions? And this more or less represents our static knowledge um, of what is grammatical versus ungrammatical in the language or for Ojibwe speakers, what's grammatical versus ungrammatical. But it doesn't really have much to say about how this occurs in real time. Um, so uh, that's not a criticism, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a starting point. And so we're gonna kind of build that theory um, today. And the major challenge that's been recognized for some time now is that um, when, we, when, we make, uh, when we process, we make parsing commitments incrementally. Um, so with incomplete information, uh, we begin to make basically predictions about how the sentence is going to turn out. And so uh, what we're going to ask is how does obviation information and, and therefore prominence information more generally um, come into play incrementally during processing to generate expectations about what structures uh, might be upcoming. And in particular about uh, what will, what, uh, whether the argument will be a subject or object or an agent and patient. And so in that spirit, we're going to just take a step back um, from the particulars of Algonquin languages and note that this, this long-standing observation um, that nearly all languages show a preference for subject relative clauses or SRCs over object relative clauses. And if you read these um, sentences, you might even feel that, um, that effect. And one idea, by no means the only idea um, though, is um, that the subject gap advantage is due to predictions occurring at the filler. So when you identify um, a filler, you predict that it will be um, a subject. And for now, I'm going to um, kind of conflate the notions of, of subject and, and agent. I'll be a little bit more careful about that later. But how does this uh, get us the subject gap advantage? Well, basically, when this prediction turns out to be correct, so as with the SRC, processing is easy, everything is good. When it turns out to be incorrect, um, we have to either reanalyze or kind of readjust our expectations, and uh, that creates difficulties. 
so the interesting thing for today is that the subject gap advantage is modulated by the animacy of the filler. So in the previous sentences, we saw an animate filler, um, and now we have an inanimate filler. And what happens here is uh, we see a decrease or basically an elimination of the subject um, gap advantage. So in very general predictive terms, we can say the probability of predicting a subject gap is modulated by animacy. So with an inanimate noun, you don't make um, as strong as a prediction as you do with uh, animate nouns. The generalization that I want to put forward um, is that these subject gap predictions are, are influenced by the, the person animacy hierarchy, the PAH, in a very generic way. So in particularly, or in particular, the higher a category is on the PAH, the more uh, likely uh, the prediction of that uh, what will be upcoming is a subject gap um, will become. So animate leads to stronger predictions than inanimate, as we've seen. Um, and then predict, uh, crucially, uh, proximate will also lead to stronger predictions than obvious. Another way to look at this is just that generally direct alignments are expected um, over inverse. So we're taking this full PAH. And again, we can see um, this mapping uh, from animate to inanimate. Our animate to subject is a direct alignment and inanimate to object. Um, uh, or animate to object is uh, inverse alignment. So if we play the same game with proximate, we can uh, draw this, this nice analogy and uh, uh, derive our prediction that uh, kind of like animate nouns in English and in many other languages, proximate nouns in Ojibwe should be predictively encoded as uh, subjects or agents. OK, so to test this um, prediction about basically the generality of um, uh, person-based prominence effects and how they affect prediction. I worked with two different um, Ojibwe um, speaking communities in Northwestern Ontario shown here on the map uh, approximately. So in total 16 people uh, participated in the study. Everyone who took part um, speaks Ojibwe as their first language, continues to speak it today. Um, all but one of the participants also spoke English as a, as a second language. Um, most of those people learned English around the age of six. Um, and then the average age of participants was 64. And one third of uh, the people that uh, took part were from Nigigus Minikonig, that's also known as Red Gut. And then the other two thirds were from uh, Seine River. And they're just about half an hour, uh, 45 minutes away from each other, depending on how snowy it is. Okay, so the method uh, that I use to kind of ask this question about prediction is a visual world task. So I recorded uh, gaze patterns with a web camera, um, and you can kind of see the setup uh, here with a couple snacks uh, in the background too. Okay, and so in the task, uh, Ojibwe speakers, or in this case, listeners, uh, were first shown three pictures on the screen. And ultimately what they needed to do was identify which image uh, matched the meaning of the sentence that they heard. And here's an example of a sentence that they heard. This is uh, kind of wrong in two ways. It's in English. What they heard was an Oji Ojibwe and it was not written. It was played over uh, speakers. Um, but this is an SRC. And so if they were looking at these pictures, they might um, start uh, out here on the upper left, move their gaze over there, look down there, um, and eventually settle back on uh, the picture of the elder laughing at the man. Um, uh, getting the right interpretation. And so what we see of these pictures is the top one um, here is uh, congruent with the meaning. The one on the right here um, is uh, a rule reversal. And then the bottom one here actually uh, does not include the head noun of the relative clause. So it can be ruled out kind of incrementally as they're hearing the sentence. And of course, I reversed the order of um, where these pictures were on the screen. So they weren't always in this configuration. Um, and as uh, the sentence was playing and these pictures were shown, I just recorded the gaze pattern as I, as I mentioned with the web camera. And then that allowed um, me to figure out after um, many, uh, many hours of arduous uh, coding of frames um, to look at the gaze patterns and uh, determine incremental interpretation of the sentences. So what did the sentences look like in Ojibwe? So the sentences were in a two by two design. So I manipulated the uh, head noun of the relative clause and then whether voice marking was ultimately direct or inverse. So I'll walk through these um, cases one by one, but for now what I want you to notice is basically the scheme of, of the word order is all the same. 
Um, so they started with a preamble and then they got the head noun and then the embedded verb and then the second um, non-head um, argument of the embedded verb. So there's no cues to word order as to what type of relative clause they're entering um, or the meaning of the sentence. So instead, the combination of direct um, uh, direct inverse marking and obviation must be used. So if our head noun is proximate, as it is in this case, and our voice is direct, um, as we went over earlier, we'll get the interpretation that the head is the agent, because direct alignments, the proximate noun is associated with the, the agent thematic role. Okay, so we'll get elder laughing at man. Now, if we hold that uh, proximate status um, constant, so we have a proximate head noun, now we just change our voice to inverse, we'll get the reverse um, interpretation. Okay, so now we'll get man laughing at elder. Now, if we change the obviation, uh, but now have inverse voice, we'll go back to our uh, elder laughing at man interpretation, um, getting that inverse alignment uh, with argument role. And then finally, rounding out the paradigm, uh, obviative head, uh, direct voice, we'll go back to man laughing at elder as the target, um, as the target picture. Okay, so now kind of going back to the big picture of the stimuli, we have this critical period of ambiguity. So um, uh, I don't think I actually noted this explicitly yes, uh, yet, but um, uh, proximate marking, uh, well, that's actually the unmarked form of the verb. Obviative is marked with a short suffix. So basically the time between um, where, you, where the uh, obviation of the head down is uh, apparent and you get the direct inverse, uh, direct inverse marker, that's a period of ambiguity. So you can't actually really know yet at that point whether you're um, entering a subject relative clause or an object relative clause. And that's the point that we're really interested in um, uh, looking at the gaze patterns in uh, seeing based on just the obviation of the head noun, uh, do people uh, generate an expectation by um, looking at one picture or another? And this is exactly what this slide outlines, the main questions. So by looking at um, where people's eyes are moving around to the pictures, uh, do they look more at the picture where the head noun is the agent or the picture where the head noun is the patient? And by the way, I should say that all of these sentences, I um, there was a practice session ahead of time uh, and all the characters were identified. So they knew who the man was, who the elder was, um, and so on and so forth. So there wasn't any confusion about, uh, about the characters. Um, and so this provides an incontrovertible test for prediction. So there's no actual uh, grammatical information that can tell you. Um, so all that you would be using is this, um, this information from obviation. And then the second thing we can ask is how accurately ultimately do people interpret these sentences after disambiguation? And we can measure this by examining uh, picture selection uh, results. Okay, so first though, the looking results. And so the top graph shows um, the patterns of looks combined across um, uh, the two proximate conditions. So this is regardless of the voice marking because that has not been encountered yet in um, this figure that I'm, I'm, I'm showing you. And then the bottom uh, part shows it with the um, obviative conditions. So time zero here is where that information about obviation comes online. And then uh, as you go to the right, that's uh, increasing milliseconds um, after that point. Uh, excluding, um, depending on the trial, any um, uh, frames that begin to bleed into once the direct inverse marking is encountered. So this is, these are all uh, ambiguous frames that we're looking at here. And what we see with the uh, approximate condition is that pro the proportion of agent looks, that's that solid line, um, is steadily increasing um, over the course of this region. Um, and indeed, in this, this kind of grayish box is a cluster of significance uh, based on the cluster permutation test. Um, and if we compare that to the obviative nouns, these two uh, lines, the agent and the patient looks, are basically right on uh, top of each other. There's no difference um, uh, incrementally um, uh, between the, those two conditions at that point, but the distractor is in contrast being rolled out. Okay, and if you test the interaction between these, there is indeed a main effect there of um, obviation as well. Okay. So accuracy, the, the final picture selection data is a bit more um, complex in comparison. So by far the most accurate condition there is the proximate direct one. So here the proximate head was interpreted as the agent um, and uh, then uh, accuracy decreased in the final picture selection 
um, when voice ended up being inverse, so the head was the patient. So the obviative uh, shows the same patterns if you think about it in terms of not direct inverse voice, but whether the head was the agent or not. So with the inverse voice um, where the head is the agent, that was more accurate than cases where the head was the patient. And then also there's an overall uh, decrease in accuracy in the obviative um, compared to the proximate conditions. Okay, so that's a lot of data um, at once, but just to kind of summarize the, the main, uh, the greatest hits, so under ambiguity, uh, we saw anticipatory looks towards the agent image with proximate heads and no preference um, uh, with obviative heads. And then following disambiguation, interpretation was more accurate first um, when the head was proximate. And then second, when the head down of the relative clause was ultimately the agent. So to capture this range of effects, I um, I propose, and, and this uh, is laid out in more detail in my dissertation, um, a re revision of the active filler strategy. So in short, um, what happens is a filler leads to the predictive formation of a movement chain and its associated structure. So there's three conditions on the formation of this chain. First, it has to terminate in the theta assigning position. Second, uh, each link in the chain must be as short as possible. Um, and then finally, uh, each link must maximize the expected well-formedness. Or um, we could say in the case of incomplete information, um, expected well-formedness. Okay, so the first condition is the chain th terminates in a theta assigning position. So for current purposes, that's either the um, external or internal uh, argument position. Um, and the major benefit is what we get here is uh, automatic assignment of then the agent or patient um, role, uh, depending on um, which of these two locations the chain uh, terminates in. So this critically actually makes the assignment of thematic role dependent on first coming up uh, with a parse. In other words, this is a syntax first uh, model. So the second condition is the uh, syntactic distance um, and each link should be minimized. And this leads to two different basic effects for our current purposes. And the first is the subject gap advantage. So basically, if you hold the chain termination point constant, so uh, in this case, uh, terminating it in the external argument position, uh, you will always prefer, based on this minimality uh, principle, a chain with multiple smaller links, uh, that's the top one there, compared to a chain with one log link, okay, where that, that position is skipped. So skipping the subject uh, position is dispreferred. And then second, it also predicts the agent first advantage. And this is just based on length alone because the external argument position is um, syntactically higher than the internal argument position. Um, you predict that you should be a have a preference for um, uh, encoding that argument as the agent. Okay, the third and final pressure is to uh, maximize incremental well-formedness. And here the idea is that Predictions are generated based on what's most likely to be well-formed given the information that's available at that point. Okay, um, and this gets a little bit um, hairy, but I'll kind of walk through it. So here the relevant information that we're dealing with is um, obviation, and we can consider uh, two different alignments with uh, structural, structural positions. Um, so first is the argument position, and then the second is the derived position. So that's subject versus non-subject. And both of these more specific hierarchies can be derived from just a general hierarchy that says high over low. And basically what you end up with is preferring direct over inverse. So if we align, um, if we do the our, uh, alignment trick um, with uh, the uh, derived position, we will prefer aligning the proximate argument with the subject position over um, aligning it with say the object position. Okay, so we'll have a preference for proximate subjects over obviative subjects. And then second, with approximate uh, aligning it with the thematic role, we'll derive a preference for aligning proximate with the agent role um, compared to aligning it with the patient role. Okay, so uh, I don't have too much more time, uh, but if we connect these more specifically, um, with our uh, basic syntactic alignments. Um, when proximate is acting on obviative, we get uh, the proximate uh, agent preference being obeyed. And similarly, other work has shown um, that uh, we then promote the proximate argument to the subject position and that satisfies the uh, proximate subject condition. So these direct alignments are basically uh, perfect from this view in every way. Now the inverse alignment, um, 
there's a lot of syntactic work um, showing that uh, the uh, uh, the uh, proximate uh, object is ultimately promoted to subject position. You can kind of think of this as like a passivization um, type operation. So what we end up with is an obeying of this proximate um, subject alignment constraint, um, but we disobey the proximate agent preference in assigning the um, patient role um, to the proximate argument. Okay, so uh, just wrapping up to uh, tie everything together. Um, so the anticipatory looks towards the agent uh, um, uh, is uh, basically derived um, with uh, proximate arguments with an alignment of the agent first and proximate agent preferences. So both of these put the filler in the EA position. So in contrast, this lack of preference in the operative conditions is due to these two preferences uh, conflicting. So you wanna minimize um, uh, the, de the, de the dependency length, so put it in the EA position, um, but at the same time, you want to align the obviative argument with uh, the patient role. And then after voice is encountered, our effects are basically due, in one case, to the subject gap advantage. That's our more accurate response to the proximate heads. Those are always um, ending up in the subject position. And then finally, more accurate uh, responses when the head is the agent regardless of obviation. And that's the emergence of that agent first preference. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the lessons for now, um, just in, in the interest of um, not going more over time than I already am. So thank you. Thank you for that. And please leave the lessons up so that we can take a look in the, the remaining 10 minutes. Sure. I see uh, some questions in the Q&A. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, have you answered this live, if that's all right? Uh, I don't yeah. know if you can see it, but I'll read it for everyone. I can see it. All right. Uh, so I'll read the question. Do we know the relative corpus frequencies of direct and indirect morphology in general or in relatives? Uh, suppose direct is more common than inverse. I wonder if this might help explain the preemptive looks to agent with proximate heads. Uh, and the uh, they, they might also have a uh, follow-up about Austronesian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is an excellent question. Um, one that I probably should have addressed head on in the talk. Uh, you did not miss it. So basically um, what I have to say to that is, well, first we do not have a corpus of Ojibwe, or for that matter, I think any Algonquin language. Um, so it, it's a little bit of speculation, but just from my experience, um, direct is way more frequent than inverse. Um, I think that's, that's safe to say, um, but the, then the, the, the subsequent question is, does that um, kind of predict the effects that we see? Well, basically that works well for, um, um, for, for proximate, but not for obviative. Um, so if you're always um, expecting um, direct marking, then we should be seeing basically uh, the, the, uh, a stronger pattern in the obviative conditions than we already see. Uh, than we than we actually see. So that's one kind of issue. The second issue is that what explains that um, asymmetry in the first place for direct versus inverse, if it's there? I think you still need to appeal to some sort of principle like the person animacy hierarchy um, to um, ultimately explain the production pressure that um, might lead to that asymmetry in the first place. So that's my two pronged answer. And if there's, yeah. uh, while I wait to see if there are other questions or raised hand, I have uh, a quick question for you myself. Um, to what extent do you think that we may be able to find uh, a different response with um, priming? So, for instance, if you if you gave people just a ton of sentences that had the mm. sort of most dispreferred combination here of the um, uh, patient and the obvi obviative and patient. Uh, combination. Um, I, what are your intuitions about that yes. based on what we've seen? Yeah, so I think probably priming would have some kind of effect, I would imagine. Um, I haven't thought about that specifically. Um, yeah, but so I think one thing that surprised me when I when I ended up when I first started looking at these results was just kind of um, how variable the accuracy was across these different conditions. But if you kind of look at, um, I think if you look at the literature on say, um, 
people, English speakers understanding passives in these sorts of contexts, you actually see a similarly kind of horrible um, uh, uh, accuracy, let's say, uh, in those most difficult conditions. But I think it is ameliorated by, uh, I would imagine that that's ameliorated by priming. So I wouldn't expect Ojibwe to be any different um, than that. And I think a bigger question is maybe what context might I be able to set up? So these sentences just kind of came out of the blue. And so these most difficult sentences, like you have an obviative um, head noun and you get a um, direct marker, um, those might be a little bit easier if you just set up the right discourse context that would license those in the first place, which um, is kind of the question I'll be after next once I can um, conduct this sort of work again. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, thank you. I see, currently I don't see hands up. Uh, I now see a hand up, so I'm going to yes. let you follow up. Here you go. Thank you. Um, hi, Chris. This was great. Hi. Um, thank so, you. I'm sorry, uh, please introduce uh, uh, name, uh, institution, and, and pronouns. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Micho. I'm at the National University of Singapore. He, him. Um, so, uh, this is sort of my part of my follow up, but I guess I'm wondering about um, whether within Ojibwe or maybe looking at other languages too, whether there are ways of really uh, disentangling these different factors, for example, the structural factors you talked about and frequency, mm -hmm. right? So, um, yeah. and in, in particular, for example, uh, for my part of the world, what I'm, you know, what I'm thinking about is. Uh, at least the sort of widespread now consensus approach to Philippine type languages like Tagalog is that uh, the so-called patient voice kind of constructions um, is, are syntactically more complicated, right? They look more like your inverse structures syntactically. Um, yeah. However, they are more frequent in, um, in speech. Um, and we know that <laughs> through in corpus frequency that they, they are more frequent and that's been part of the background of uh, early discussions about, you know, which actually is the, um, you know, core voice and whether this, these languages are ergative or not, right? So, so but setting right. that aside. Um, so setting, setting aside thinking of that in terms of uh, frequency as a basis for which should be considered syntactically simpler or not, I guess what I'm, the point I wanted to make or wanted to ask about is, isn't it, isn't it possible that you still, a language codifies a syntactically more complex structure as a more frequent derivation? Or do you generally, would we generally expect that that would be dispreferred? So I think if you just thought about, so yeah, it depends what you mean by complexity. Um, so that's one thing. I would, I personally would expect there to be some other pressure that is somehow kind of um, taking over um, that is allowing that the pressure from complexity, complexity to sort of be overridden, let's say. Um, and so I think that's basically, it. now this is a good slide um, to look at, like generally speaking, the inverse is considered more complex than the direct um, but once you have an omitive head noun, it seems like people are more accurate um, at that. Um, so that's kind of what I was getting at when um, you can't just simply say that you people expect direct to be upcoming. Um, it has to be kind of more complicated. It's conditioned on this other factor, which is, um, yeah, the, the obviation status of the noun that's sort of involved in the dependency. So I wonder if in the, these cases that you're looking at, whether there's not some, it may be from the person animacy hierarchy that's making that patient voice um, kind of rise rise above the other ones. Uh, it'd be really interesting to kind of get to the bottom of that. Um, but basic, my basic like view on frequency is you have to explain why that the frequency is like that in the first place. Um, and so maybe yes, eventually it does get, um, codified with that pathway, but you still have to explain the production pressure that would lead to the frequency discrepancy in the first place. Um, Thank you. Yeah. All right. And that yeah. will be Thank our you. last question since we are right at time. 
Uh, thank you all. This has been Psycholinguistics 1 Part 2. Uh, and thank you all for the excellent talks and looking forward to seeing you around at the conference. And thank you Thanks for helping for your role. Thank you, too. <laughs> thank you, guys. Session is closing now. Thank you.